Hello and welcome back to Inside Value with me, Siam Dingi. It's great to have you here once again. This is our second installment of Value in Practice, where we invite our guests to speak about their understanding of value in their area of expertise. And today we've got Nombumere Lombushwe as our guest. Nombumere is a highly skilled strategic consultant who has developed her expertise in enterprise development and change management over the past 15 years. With a proven track record of success across a diverse industries, she excels in using developmental frameworks to drive organizational sustainability. Nombumerelo is a consummate professional who, b- who brings a wealth of strategic insights to empower businesses for long-term success. Her versatile skill set, coupled with extensive experience, makes her a valuable asset to any organization looking to achieve sustained growth and success. Her favorite quote, nothing that is human is alien by Maya Angelou. Thank you once again, Nombumerelo, for joining us on Inside Value today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored. Uh, looking forward to, yeah, looking forward to it. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So let's begin, of course, with your origin story. So how mm-hmm. did you get your start in strategy consulting? So actually, when I finished school, right, when I finished my matric, mm-hmm. I started, uh, I've always I did business and economics. I did accounting. Those were my favorite subjects in high school. Mm -hmm. And I went on then to pursue uh, in economics and accounting double major. However, I also worked at the same time. Then uh, being (laughs) being young, ambitious and all that, I then started climbing the ladder because it was one of those things that I'm going to be a part-timer while I'm working, um, while I'm studying, I'll work, you know. But it ended up being the other way where now I was working so much and I grew within the organization and I had um, I was in management positions, leadership mm-hmm. positions, and I was trained to be in a uh, brand leader. So the, I was still young. I, remember, and they, I was like most probably before 20. This was around 1920. So all of that, the responsibility of running a business, learning, my mentor then um, was so helpful. And then I, yeah, I grew within, right? I grew within my career, as you'd say. And for the, then it was my first job. That's what I knew. And I was going to be uh, in a brand, a regional leader. So, yeah. But then my mom forced me to go back to school full time. Uh-huh. Right? <laughs> so I had to then uh, re- rethink. So then I remember I was doing economics and accounting. Mm-hmm. But then, then I was like, okay. And after working, having my first experience of working, then I was like, oh, you too funky or too fashionable to be an accountant, you know? And being naive me, then I changed my degree to politics, philosophy, and economics. Oh. Something that yeah, felt very much like almost me holistically. So when people see me, they don't just box me into one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and from there... I think that's when, uh, because, you know, when you studying uh, politics, all of them, okay, politics, philosophy, you you actually learn how to use your analytical skills and your critical skills, mm-hmm. right? And um, from the work experience, that's something I realized that I enjoyed business and economics and accounting, not only in a sense of studying, but in practice. Okay, that is such an incredible journey. I did not quite expect to hear the politics aspect. People tend to imagine that business people have, you know, the ordinary business accounting, one of the two, or entrepreneurship, but they don't ever quite imagine you drawing from other parts or completely different. In fact, humanities and business are almost always at odds. So it's very interesting to see that you had had a humanities background in addition to your business background. That's so fascinating. So then how did you break into enterprise development? So you went through all of your undergrad and um, your your academic programs and all that good stuff. You entered into strategic consulting. So how did you move into enterprise development where you are currently? So where I'm currently, so um, I've worked in diverse industries, right? So I haven't worked in. So usually uh, a lot of times when people meet me, Uh, they always ask, so what do you do in which industry? And it's always such a frustration because I'm like, 
it's not about the industry. You know, I can work, you can put me in any industry. I, I've, I've thrived in the different industries that I've worked in and ended up in leadership or management. Mm -hmm. So uh, th that was my frustration. So it was almost like when I was having my own uh, skills audit because I'm also continuously uh, studying myself. I'm continuously studying and improving um my my own skill sets, my expertise and interests. So how I ended up in enterprise development is that I had I have my own consultancy, right? Which I do organizational strategy. And I was like, this is what I do. I do uh, organizational change management. I do the business coaching and the leadership and all of that. And I think also then I was also narrow-minded in my perspective. So when I... I joined, so I'll just give a backdrop of how I ended up in the position in terms of enterprise development. So the, um, the, um, the organization that I'm currently working for or the director of a enterprise development had a webinar. I mm -hmm. joined in, then it was Q and A and I asked the question, then the CEO was like, oh, that's an interesting uh, perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And then, she, then I was like, oh, okay, you know, it's like a webinar. You just you engaging because you're there right. and I was like yeah so that's what I think and then they're like hey, can you send us your number what do you do then I was like no I do organizational strategy then they asked can we actually meet you then I was like all right and uh we met and after the few you notes know, first they asked for my company profile my bio and then after um then after a few phone calls then I went to go meet them the whole executive was there and then we just spoke and then they were like Actually, forget about what you said you came here for. <laughs> We'd like you <laughs> to be the enterprise um development uh, uh man um director. Wow. And that's how uh, that's how it, it happened. And it's been a great journey. I've learned I'm learning so much. I think also when I saw you, right? Mm -hmm. I was just like, so you know, like when you're thinking business strategy, okay, uh, organizational strategy, but within this role now, moving corporate strategy, and it's like, okay, you know, mm -hmm. but ultimately, I think being a strategist, you also understand that it's strategy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we will be covering quite a bit of quite a couple of questions as it relates to, you know, the interplay of strategy within enterprises, within organizations. So we're going to be tapping quite a bit on your expertise for the duration of this of this interview. But as sort of like a wrap up of you type questions, uh, can you then tell us what you're most responsible for in your role as now the enterprise uh, sort of Enterprise Development Director. Just a, a brief overview. A brief overview. So um, the organization, or let me rather say the, it's more of um, a developmental agency or, or regulatory board, right? So mm -hmm. we cover all the sectors within township and rural businesses. So roughly um, my, my main role as the director is... Um, is to ensure that we are crafting, firstly crafting and executing strategies that firstly align with the organizational goals. Mm -hmm. So that's the main thing that, that I'm always, uh, because you can get so caught up and lost, especially mm -hmm. when you have so many industries and so many entrepreneurs under um, the, the business that uh, that's the one thing I'm very key on. And then also, uh, something that is very true to myself is ensuring that there's sustainability and then there's also sustainable growth and uh, in ways of trying to ensure that the businesses, because these businesses are mainly in townships and rural areas, that they can also um, embrace or get into the um, technology space in terms of their businesses. Yeah. All right. That's actually really incredible. That's fantastic work that you're doing. And ostensibly, it's about bringing the township economies and rural economies into the spaces where they might be able to compete more effectively by supporting them in terms of their strategic development. And it's something that tends to be because they are, you know, more in the fringes of the enterprise environment, which is to say they are not where, you know, the large players are. They tend not to see how the large players play and interact 
And as a result, you know, as a function almost of the environment that they operate in, they kind of don't really see almost the need of incorporating, you know, organizational strategies of or, you know, um, enterprise strategies. So it's very good to see that there are agencies and our parties that are helping these um, rural and township businesses and enterprises kind of get on the map where everybody else is to give them a chance yeah. to grow and scale, which is fantastic. All right. So let's now get into the meat of our conversation or our discussion. Uh, in your experience, what have you seen in the past through your work? Do you now consider to be the most important elements of a su successful business strategy? In my experience, is um, it's I think a successful business strategy must align. So one thing that I've experienced is that there needs to be um, an understanding of the market, right? The market, your clientele or your consumer, the dynamics of that market okay. and how you as a business in terms of your own, um, whether let's say organizational goals, how then uh, you translate or how you, you are part of that ecosystem. You know, where do you play? How do you join in? What service uh, or what offering are you bringing and what value are you adding within that ecosystem? So I think it's something that businesses, uh, when you start out to, to be, a, to say, I'm going to start a business as much as you think of market demand, supply and your expertise, but then consider the dynamics as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I completely agree with your assertion that there has to be a level of alignment, not only with your business goals and business objectives, as you've mentioned, but also alignment within the strategies themselves. Quite a few businesses have run into a bit of trouble when their own strategies that they put together don't quite align with what they said they're going to do with the way in which they do business. And it actually segues quite nicely into the next question, which is within the value innovation methodology itself, there's a very big emphasis on the notion that all of the strategies within an enterprise, be it a business or a nonprofit organization, they all coexist and interplay with each other to create or destroy value. So yeah. looking back on the past engagements in terms of uh, strategy development or any strategic work or any enterprise development work in terms of strategy, is this a notion that you agree with? that the strategies themselves interplay to create or destroy value? And also, have you seen it actually in practice, in play at your work? Um, I agree, firstly, with, uh, I, I, I truly agree. I think there is, should be, there's an interconnectedness, right? Mm -hmm. That strategies should have, and especially uh, within starting within the organization, because mostly you'll find that, and we'll, maybe we'll speak of it as in uh, departments or portfolios working in silos, mm -hmm. and each portfolio comes up with their own strategy in terms of how then they'll meet uh, the company ob ob objectives. But to find that when you sit with the overall um, strategies for the organization, some of them are conflicting or they erode some of the other strategies. So it, it's it's something, and this is something that's very key that um, businesses should take in into 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 uh, um, factor in when they say like I know you the director or you're the head, you're the senior manager, come up with a strategy for your department. Mm -hmm. But it is also important to consolidate those strategies and ensure that, um, because sometimes you find that you can actually even, which is key to strategy, it's not more about um, managing complexity, but then it's mm -hmm. about simplifying, it, right? Uh, that's the key to strategy. So that's what I believe that, uh, organizations or businesses or if they should be looking at in terms of um, value innovation and the strategies being connected or interconnected. Absolutely. And the example that you gave of there being silos between departments is such an apt example because that's where we see the strategy starting to fall apart, where each department has their own sort of idea of how to go about strategizing, how to go about doing their job, how to go about creating value. And mm -hmm. I use this example a lot, but the greatest, the greatest example of where you can see those strategies starting to 
clash and conflict is where you've got the marketing team saying that this is the value that we want to, to create. The sales team who is effectively um, practicing the marketing strategy and taking it to market saying, actually, that doesn't work in practice when we engage the clients. And then once the sale has been made, the sort of, you know, if you're in a service type of business, the people that go and they do the service, so the technicians coming back and saying, but now when I went to the client and they said that you sold them this salesperson, when I went to go and do the thing, it actually didn't work out. So that silo effect can end up eroding the value that everybody thinks that they're trying to create and even on an organizational level. So I definitely like resonate and hear that that point that you are making. To the point now of strategies starting to conflict, have you ever had an instance in your um in your experience where you looked into an enterprise, be it a business because you you operate within businesses or a nonprofit because you know nonprofit spaces are uh, quite prevalent as well? Where you looked inside and you said, oh my goodness, yikes, the strategies are substantially conflicting. How did you go about now resolving that conflict and then now recapturing the value that was lost? Right. So I in in this regard, I think this is we have um change management and um yeah, comes in a lot for me and just also the the leadership. Uh, cons uh, executive coaching and all of that comes in a lot in terms that there is a lot of communication that needs to happen and collaboration amongst the teams, amongst the directors, amongst the heads, and it needs to filter through to all the employees. So when when I've been in businesses where I've found that such conflicts, um, it was often a matter of revisiting, right? Revisiting um all the overarching, you say the overarching goals of the organization and then ensuring that um, there is alignment. So ultimately you find that when there is such a situation, what really need, what the key, I think the two main things is the collaboration part mm -hmm. and the communication. So those two become so key because, and especially when it comes to, um, you know, we like the buzzword of last year, co-creating, mm -hmm. because that's what it's not the leadership deciding or the 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 employees themselves deciding, but then it's a whole uh, team effort to mm -hmm. ensuring that the overarching goals are achieved. So the communication is key and the collaboration. Okay. All right. So now to take us a little bit, well, we're still within the, the realm of questioning, right? Um, yeah. So within your uh, work in the enterprise development space specifically, have there been any sort of trends that you've noted amongst the enterprises you've engaged with in the way that they strategize to create value? Where you're like, okay, everybody seems to be going about it the same way, or are there any patterns that you've seen, no matter how small they are? Or are they mostly sort of going about it their own way, their own direction, where there's not really much of a pattern going on? So I'm actually so fortunate to be able to work with all types, like in terms of scale, mm -hmm. like really um, top-end manufacturing businesses to your open-air hawkers, informal traders, to your middle, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but what thing that I've realized from the different um, levels I could or gradings that we would put them is that there's a huge shift in terms of the digital transformation right mm -hmm. everyone wants to sort of be within the digital space and like I know with our organization we even have a marketplace mm -hmm. because that we, um, I think, uh, I, and that's most probably also COVID pushed us a, a bit uh, more in terms of people realizing the importance of the digital transformation. And uh, a second one, I think with uh, businesses that are more settled or that have already started, mm -hmm. or let, no, let me say you that ha up, are over the three years. One thing I've realized is that they become they're becoming more customer centric in their approach. Wow. 
So now it's no longer that I'm trying to survive or I have the service, I have the skill, I'm going to start a business, you know. But then now they're starting to refine uh, their product or their services to uh, be more customer centric um, and have that whole customer experience. And then I, I think the last one, mm, yeah, the last one, and this is something that I'm also very key and passionate about in terms of the frameworks that I use is the sustainability part, mm -hmm. right? However, I must say this is for your top end businesses mm -hmm. because it's not necessarily that you'll find that uh, your, your puzzle shop owner is thinking uh, about uh, sustainability reporting frameworks mm -hmm. or the SD within the business. But you see that more with your other um, business or services that are on the higher end scale in terms of yeah success or how long they've been in business. Cool. So to sort of throw a curveball question at you then, would you then say that um, seeing a small business, you know, growing and growing and growing, one of its growth markers would be an increased in, uh, interest in undertaking sustainability uh, work or sustainability uh, frameworks and methodologies in their operations, because now they're becoming, okay, now we're past the point of just trying to survive. We're now in a comfortable place. We're now trying to grow and scale. Now is the time that we actually have the resources to now say, cool, we're ready to start throwing in some sustainability frameworks into our operations. I, I find it that way because to be honest, if for the businesses that we're talking about, right, mm -hmm. just thinking of um, the fact from governance, compliance, um, you know, let's take just as puzzle shop talking hygiene food hygiene all of those things that need to be done on a day-to-day -day basis and just in terms of capacity building for them to understand why is it necessary for a business to run in that in that way it then adding in um sustainability mm -hmm. it's i i think it's it doesn't and you'd find that more, some of them, they are within the SDGs. They do mm -hmm. fall under those, right? But then the implementation is not necessarily uh, of the SDGs or of uh, maybe climate. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give an example of, uh, you know, the the people who, who sell, um, what's it, uh, who chickens on mm -hmm. the street, right? And mm -hmm. then they, they yeah. <laughs> Like, I, um, what, I don't know what they call them, but yeah, them. Because if if you coming from a climate perspective, right? Mm -hmm. You're looking and you're thinking, this is pollution. Like all, all of that, you know, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, but then for you going to tell that person, would you, no, Mari, uh, what you're doing is actually polluting because the the the, the carbon fuse and all of that. And, mm -hmm. and now you're trying to, then it's like, but this is how I do business. See, Chisanyama. So now our questions are going to be taking on a more future-focused view of strategy and value creation. So the first one being, from your perspective, what are some of the biggest opportunities that you see on the horizon for businesses specifically and possibly nonprofit organizations as well specifically? Yeah. I think the biggest one, definitely, uh, we need to leverage uh, emerging technologies. We need to be friends with AI um, and uh, we need to get over the, the what would I say, the mistrust or, or, of, of thinking that no being on a digital space or sharing your business, your expertise or using such technologies uh, would hinder your success. I, I think it's just a matter of capacitating ourselves or learning how to use them in a way that ensure that uh we we thrive mm -hmm. when using right um and then a, a big one uh, a big big one mm -hmm. will be sustainable practices we can't get away from those mm -hmm. uh whether 
yeah, we, we need to really start looking at it. And whether it's SDGs, ESGs, uh, it's your, um, your frameworks of GI, GIR, whatever framework you are looking at, but then you need to ensure that as a business, there is some social responsibility that you, um, you, you, you carry in mm -hmm. being within that community. And you it's not even to say that you're carrying it, it's to give back because you're within that space, you exist in that area and you can't just be there just to make profits. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's one thing that uh, sustainable practices. So I spoke about uh, technology and global collaboration, collaboration and globally. So not mm -hmm. just yeah global collaboration because you find that there's the interchange sometimes i've seen with um i'll speak again to sdgs because something that i'm currently working in mm -hmm. that some of the learnings from uh, amsterdam right mm. and then you you translate then the sharing of that knowledge and of that collaboration because ultimately we're all looking at trying to create impact but then you find that the areas that need impact more compared to we, we, it's you know the geopolitics are there but we need then to understand that beyond the politics there's a learning and within that collaboration whether it is moving knowledge or skills or money in terms of creating that impact mm -hmm. um the the global collaboration is important absolutely and on that point on collaboration, not only in terms of like the global collaboration aspect, but something that occurred to me was not only business to business collaboration, nonprofit to nonprofit, but business to nonprofit collaboration, particularly mm -hmm. as it relates to you know, businesses getting more into their social impact, understanding how it is that their business contributes to the development and sustainability of the communities around them. It would actually be a wonderful idea if as a business leader, you would say, okay, I need to find a NPO leader that is after the kind of impact that I want to create. So the two could then work collaboratively to say, okay, now I know the NPO says, I know that I've got a major donor or a donor of some sort, a partner of some sort that I know uh, in this business leader could come along and support our NPO and we could, you know, help them create the impact that they're looking to create. So that's an area of synergy that I also, from your point that you raised, can kind of see there. So yeah. in terms of the strategic development and the drive to create value, uh, what other, what do you think that other industry leaders are really paying attention to right now? You had mentioned the biggest opportunities, which is uh, sustainability, technology, but are there any other things that industry leaders in particular are paying attention to in terms of strategy development and in terms of value creation that you might think that the listeners would benefit from, you know, getting an inside look on? All right. Uh, so can I just backtrack something? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> the MPO part, because it's also such a... Um, um, a passion of mine in terms of what so um I think we've spoken about this in terms of how I, I am um for private private uh, private public partnerships mm -hmm. and it's because of that very thing that M NGOs and MPOs or CSOs really need to start looking at innovative ways right or practices mm -hmm. in terms of how they operate and there's also also that reality, like when you were speaking about the donor and that we could look at it for me, um, the reason why I look at it from a PPP perspective is because mm. I'm saying that we might sit with the skill set as corporate, right? However, the resources to ensure that uh, we achieve this, whether it's education, whether, you know, all of these things, they sit within government, mm -hmm. but the working at uh, working, uh, so actually the partnership is actually more, brings together a more viable and more effective and efficient way of ensuring that there's a sustainable uh, way of um, creating or um, giving those services to the people that need them. Mm. So that's a, of sustainability of the organization, sustainability of the service or product, and in terms of just uh, putting together the expertise of 
the both public and private. So that was for NGOs. Uh, and then so the next question, I think you're asking me about uh, industry trends, right? I think mm. data it, 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 like I've seen, and this is comes back to technology, like being data driven. Mm -hmm. You need to be like, uh, that's one thing that organizations and uh, are very big and moving towards, which also I think it's very strategic to do that because then you, you're also saving uh, more resources in terms of ensuring that you are um, using data driven or your decisions are based on data driven on that on data okay. uh, uh, and um, integrating sustainability um, within your your strategy um, I think it's not only the right or responsible thing to do mm -hmm. but then it, it, um, it actually uh, it's something that when you have those ethos, because when we speak of sustainability, there's certain ethics and ethos that go with sustainability. Then you find that some it, it the organizational culture follows mm -hmm. the same because you're not just going to have values and ethics of sustainability, but not practice them within the organizational yeah, culture. So I think it it will help in creating the sustainability in terms of hopefully eroding but let's say um uh for now I, I hope it does erode stuff like your red tape your corruption and all of that mm -hmm. but yes yeah, because one thing I remember when I was writing one of my papers on sustainable organizations and I was told by a very um wise and <laughs> you know he's he's worried in so many industries here in South Africa. And he was like, the thing about saying, uh, looking at sustainable organizations or the frameworks of creating sustainable um, uh, organizations mm -hmm. might be flawed in a sense that you can't have sustainable organizations without having sustainable people. Aha, uh -huh. quite right. And I quite agree <laughs> with that. That sounds very, very on point. That sounds extremely yeah. on point. And I think with that, with that, um, that entire answer for that question, you've answered another question that I was going to ask in terms of the advice that you would have for NPO and business leaders that are looking to stay relevant and successful when going about creating value in the long term. I think you've covered it quite excellently, actually. Um, the high points of paying attention to data. Uh, the high points of paying attention to sustainability when you are in the position to be able to take more sustainable practices, uh, looking out for your ethics, making sure that your, your, your strategies line up right from the outset. These are all points that you mentioned throughout the, the interview that we've had together. And I think now for this section, the final question should be, where do you now see strategic development as a whole evolving towards in the next five to 10 years? We, um, I think in the next five to 10 years, it's agility. Mm -hmm. We need to ensure that definitely sustainability will always be at the top, but then we also need to agility. And we also, so it's those three things. And the last one will be leveraging technologies. We can't uh, get away from that. So if we can embrace how we um, sort of align or work a way that we can use all these three, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we strategy, strategy in, in essence and strategic development would move far much ahead and especially for a developing country for as us leveraging on these three, the tech, the sustainable practices, and what was the last one that I mentioned? I said the agility, we need mm -hmm. to be agile be stuck in, in, in our ways <laughs> yeah so I think those three <laughs> wonderful all right so now to close this has been a wonderful interview but now for some three rapid fire questions the first and ideally in a sentence or less right they're they're rapid fire questions the first question is what single podcast or video or book or article have you listened to or read that shifted or changed your perspective on the work that you do? HBR Leadership on Leadership Podcast. All right. Number two, what one singular piece of advice would you give to someone who's just starting out in their business or running their nonprofit organization? 
start, start and uh, start with the basics. Awesome. And then finally, do you have any last closing remarks that you have for the listeners, uh, for everyone who has listened in, uh, for everyone who, you know, might be touched or uh, is even vaguely interested in what we have spoken about today? Um, so one thing that I would say is uh, we, we there's a lot a lot of work that needs to be done, right? And I'm always big on ensuring that as much as we need to survive as humans, but then we need to also make sure that whatever we do has impact and uh, has purpose in terms of your own personal fulfillment. So I, I would say that within the work and within the space that you find yourself, ensure that, um, yeah, just look into the purpose of what you're doing and the impact that it has beyond just uh, your bank account or just your own personal wealth, but then the entire community because we don't live in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Wonderful closing remark. Thank you so much for your incredible insights, Nombo Melelo. It was a joy having you here. And I'm sure everyone listening in got to learn something new and fantastic about strategy, enterprise development, and value strategy. Thank you. Thank you. It's always so great talking to you. You're one of the best people that, especially when we have to discuss strategy, uh, you know, because uh, you come within that value space of value strategy and I come with the organization and it's always great to bounce off and feed off each other. Oh. So thank you once again for inviting me and looking forward to more of and listening to your podcast and um, listen to other guests. Thank you. And <laughs> thank you. That does it for this episode. Uh, thank you for listening in, first and foremost. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to Inside Value on your preferred podcast platform. Be sure to follow Weave Consulting on LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. And visit our website on weave.co.za. That is V-I-V-R-E dot C-O.za for more insights on value creation, value innovation, and value strategy. This has been Inside Value with me, Siam Dingi. See you in the next one.